embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations for the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. And today on the Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Subhadeep Das, a dedicated scientist with a strong background in eukaryotic gene regulation. Subhadeep began his academic journey by obtaining his PhD from Jadavpur University in India, where he worked as a graduate student research assistant under the guidance of Professor Biswadeep Das in the Department of Life Science and Biotechnology. During this time, his research focused on understanding the mechanism of nuclear retention of SKS1, mRNA, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Subhadeep's academic journey pursuits led him to Purdue University, where he now serves as a postdoctoral research assistant under the mentorship of Professor Elizabeth Tran. Since January 2022, he has been delving into two critical research areas. First one is investigating the role of RNA secondary structure in eukaryotic gene regulation. And the second is exploring the role of DDX5, a dead box RNA helicase in small cell lung cancer. Welcome, welcome to the program, Subhadeep. Thank you so much for taking time to tell us about yourself, about your journey, and this awesome research that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm really honored to be a part of this lecture series. So I got to know about it from my friend, Aisia, who also gave a similar talk from the yes. department. He is a very good friend of mine. He inspired me to do it. And apart from that, I have another senior, Shayok Shamadda. He is at Eli Lilly. So yes. he actually gave a talk at Pathfinder series. He like We had a lot of discussions and your interactive sessions with you. He really liked it. So I wanted to be a part of it. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Thank you wow. for the introduction. Thank you. You know yeah. how it goes then. If you've watched yeah. it, it's yeah. you uh, taking it away, putting up your presentation yeah. and letting us go into the journey with you. Thank yeah. you again. And I, I love the feedback. Uh, you know, it's always a pleasure being able to uh, meet friends of friends and uh, getting to meet new scientists that are doing some uh, such yeah. awesome research. Thank so, you. Thank you, Subhadeep. Okay, so let me present okay. myself. So here's my presentation. So, awesome. And I'm going to turn myself off and mute myself. Oh. So you take the spotlight. So... Can you see it? Yeah. So thank you. So today my talk is focused on the role of dead box helicases on small cell lung cancers. So before going on to that, I will give a brief introduction about myself. I'm Shubhadeep Das. I am a postdoctoral research assistant in Tran Lab in, under, in Department of Biochemistry, Purdue University. So before going into my talk, I would like to introduce myself where I am from. So I am from India, which is very much important important in terms of cultural heritage and it has a rich cultural heritage and it's a land of diversity every state has its own flavor has its own beauty so i belong to kolkata so kolkata is the city of joy where i was raised and born and it is famous for like many places like howrah bridge and victoria and saint paul's cathedral so i really miss this place because it's a really beautiful city everyone should visit that city so my academic journey begins from Ashutosh College, so on the University of Calcutta, so where it all began. So it's like, it was the first time after high school, I just joined uh, a college where, uh, where I was very much interested in uh, bacteria, fungus, and many other important microorganisms. 
So I started developing interest on those. The very first uh, day was tough because I have to make new friends because just after coming up from high school, it's very tough. So making new friends, understanding science, and slowly getting uh, getting interested on that. So it was very beautiful. So it was three years of my undergrad and I had a great time and I slowly uh, become a, became a microbiologist from just passing out finishing high, just by finishing high school. And then I became a microbiologist and I was very much interested with bacteria, fungus, their metabolism, etc. Then it's the time for masters. So I went to one of the most important institutes, like one of the most premier institutes of India, Jadavpur University. So it's a really beautiful campus. As you could see, it has like, like the, it has rich cultural heritage. And you could see this is the main building, Aurobindo Bhabon, and it is it has like this architecture. And this place actually inspired me a lot. I learned a lot from this place. So it actually made me a complete scientist from a microbiologist to a biotechnologist to an RNA biologist. So what? So from microbiology, I slowly started getting interested in, uh, in biotechnology. I was, there was a course called Recombinant DNA Technology in my undergrad course, where I started getting uh, introduced to uh, biotechnology. And slowly and steadily, I get, got interest in biotechnology. And I pursued it, uh, uh, like master's from this very university in biotechnology. And I joined as a PhD in this very university because of the interest. The infrastructure of this university is great, and it's really beautiful. So my PhD journey was very fun. So I published some good papers. I had some good friends. I was a part of a very good team. And I got few, I had, a, had the opportunity to give many talks, as you could see. And I also got many prizes for my talks. And this is not only research. So everybody has to understand that research, you have to propagate your research among the students. So this is actually the high school students that came to our lab. One, my friend, Anusha and me, gave a very interesting talk on how we are doing research in our lab to the students. And though that things inspired the students, after this talk, we got a lot of enthusiastic messages from the students and that inspired us a lot that at least we can actually propagate the science among the students. So that is our like the take like the takeaway from this entire thing. So what I do in my PhD. So my PhD that I, like Tommy said, like I had a very, I had the opportunity to do research on stress responsive RNA. So one of the stress responsive RNA is the SKS1 mRNA, which is sup suppressor kinase of SNF3 mutant. It's a stress responsive RNA. Under specific stress, it actually goes to the nucleus. It actually goes to a cytoplasm. It gets translated. So, so what, what my research was to understand why it is retained in the nucleus for in a, during normal uh, condition rather than in stress condition. And we found out that it's a stress responsive element, as you could see within the ORF of this SKS1 message that is responsible for its retention. And we found out that, that this, not only the stress responsive mRNA, our transacting factors may be also responsible for this genetic uh, regulation. So with this, I wrapped up my work and slowly applied to various institutes uh, like, like at the USA. And I got an opportunity at Purdue University. So why Purdue University? Because of the fact that like I had a very, like I worked with dead box helicases before. So I applied to this lab and this lab actually works with East dead box helicases as well as mammalian dead box helicases. So I had the opportunity to work in both the fields. So apart from that, Purdue campus is very beautiful and Purdue is one of the most premier institutes in US. Like it has a, it has a rich heritage, cultural heritage as well as it's, it is famous for research and it is one of the most important places in US. So I joined this uh, department. This is, this is Department of Biochemistry, Purdue University. And I, this is my lab where I joined under the mentorship of Professor Elizabeth Tran. So now I will start my talk on the role of dead box helicases in small cell lung cancers. So so let, before starting, let me give a brief glance of the cancer cell. So this is a cancer cell you could see. This is a HeLa cell, and you could see the protrusions of this uh, HeLa cell. And this is a, so cancer cells always inspired me. So inspired me in what sense? It's inspired me like how complex it is. 
So it has a rich complexity and one has to study it. And it is, as you are all aware, it is pretty nasty. So you have to treat cancer and you have to believe that cancer is not a one cause condition thing. It has a multi-cause effect and one has to study every cause of it. So with this, I had always had, had an interest on cancer, but somehow like I, I didn't go, I, I was getting opportunities back in India, but here I got the, which finally got the opportunity to explore cancer in a more, in a, in a more elaborate way, I would say. So, so before going on to my research, I would give a brief overview of central dogma. So as you are aware, like DNA gets replicated to DNA, DNA gets transcribed to mRNA, and mRNA gets translated to protein. So this is the central dogma. So I would like to focus is as DNA as thoughts, mRNA as words, and proteins as actions. So words are very important in both the sense because it is the midway between thoughts and actions. So if you look at the transcription-centric point of view of gene regulation, you could see like a transcription factor aids the RNA polymerase to sit on the promoter and the gene is turned on and you have a messenger mRNA. So this is pretty straightforward, but what's interesting is the various co-transcriptional events like capping, five prime capping, splicing, and three prime polyadenylation. So as you could see for effective export competent mRNA, you should have these co-transcriptional events like capping, splicing, and polyadenylation. And if anything goes wrong, it could lead to genetic catastrophe. So what are the important things that needs to be regulated so that you could have a good capping, splicing, and polyadenylation event? You should have a dynamic interaction between mRNA and RNA binding proteins. And this is pretty complex because this regulation needs to be controlled tightly or else it could lead to a very bad effect in the cells. So with this, I will fast forward. There is a lot of proteins that is responsible for this gene regulation, one of them being helicases. Helicases are very important proteins of every eukaryotic cells or and be it prokaryotic cells also. And what are the primary function of ATPSs? It's like it's a nucleic acid dependent ATPSs. Are the hel these helicases are the nucleic acid dependent ATPSs that unwinds double stranded structures in RNA and DNA to single stranded components. And it is important protein and is mainly involved in a wide range of functions, be it DNA replication, recombination, repair, transcription, etc. So as you could see, a wide range of processes. So helicases are a very important protein and it needs the help of ATP to unwind structures. And helicases has a rec a fold domain that is responsible for their function. So with this, I will move forward with dead box helicases that uh, my lab works. So as I said, my interest started growing in dead box helicases back in my PhD days when I was working with dead box helicases. And now I also work with dead box helicases. So dead box helicases are a very interesting protein. It has a dead motif. And what are the important thing is it has an important RNA duplex unwinding activity. So it unwinds secondary structures in RNA with the aid of ATP to single standard form, does aiding in various gene regulatory events, as well as it has like a protein displacement capability. It displaces the protein from the strands, thereby aiding in various processes. So it, as I, I, I will say, it functions in every aspects of RNA biology, be it export, be it transcription, be it various co-transcriptional event, be it other processes. It has a wide range of roles. So as this slide is mainly showing that we know very well the in vitro activities of uh, dead box helicases. It has an ATPS activity. It has an R unwinding activity. It has an RNA remodeling activity. And in vivo as well, we have a lot of dead box helicases. So we our main focus is to understand the cellular function of these dead box helicases in in vivo content, as well as the biochemical mechanism, and as well as its regulation and how it regulates specific processes. So with this aims and approaches, we move forward. But before going on to that, I would like to show the role of dead box helicases in various steps of RNA biology. So DDX5 is one of the dead box helicases in mammals. We have a yeast ortholog called DBP2 
which is also important for various steps of uh, eukaryotic gene regulation. But DDX5, as you could see, DDX5 and his East Ortholog DBP2 has been implicated in wide range of eukaryotic gene regulation. Over the past 10 years, it's very interesting to note, like DDX5 is also linked to various types of cancers and also in various types of diseases. So it says like DDX5 overexpression is very much linked to various types of cancer, be it prostate cancer, breast can cancer, and any other type of cancer. So we need to study it. So why this DDX5 is linked or why the cancer cells is addicted to this DDX5? So before going on to that, I would like to go through some papers which states the role of DDX5 in various cancers. So as you could see, DDX5 has a very important role in breast cancers, in colorectal cancer, in gastric cancer. And from our lab, we also found out that DDX5 has a role in small cell lung cancer. I haven't included uh, other papers because there are many papers that pointed the role of DDX5 in various cancers. So with this, I would like to focus more on small cell lung cancer because in 2020, we got a very interesting data which states that DDX5 has a role in small cell lung cancer, which is a very deadly type of a cancer. So small cell lung cancer is a type of lung cancer that is almost 15, that, that is encompasses almost 15% of the lung cancer cases. So you have small cell lung cancer, you have non-small cell lung cancer. But what's interesting about this cancer is, it's a neuroendocrine tumor and it has like a nine months median survival rate. So it's a very bad type of a cancer. And if one gets it, it's like the survival rate is almost, survival rate is almost nine months. And the worst problem is you do not have any medications currently available for it. We have some medications like radiotherapy and immunotherapy, but most of them have like there, it is not like it, the, it, it doesn't increases your lifespan a bit. So it can increase your lifespan by a bit only. So, and one more interesting thing is this type of cancer is exclusively associated with smoking. So smoking can actually kill you. That is the main thing. So we have seen, so there is a study by NCI uh, on with Southeast England uh, uh, people. And they found out that whenever there is like, like, like the smoking is very important for the uh, advancement of this small cell lung cancer. So what's interesting is like, in spite of like in, in United States of America, you have like good tobacco control measures, but in many countries, you do not have that. So the number is increasing at an enormous pace. The small cell lung cancer is increasing at an enormous pace due to the bad tobacco control programs. So you need more molecular studies and newer therapies for this. And obviously you need to stop smoking. That is very important. So DDX5, what you could see, this is, a, this is directly from the patient sample. So what's interesting, you could see a lot of DDX5 overexpression. This is from an 87 year old bronchus malignant tissue and it's from female who, uh, who has a smoking habit. And you could see like in small, this is a interesting data where you could see there's a huge amount of DDX5 expression, overexpression in small cell lung cancer patient. So that tells you the addiction of cancer cells towards DDX5. So in our previous study, we published our data in JBC in 2020. We found out that whenever you knock down DDX5, you have a lesser number of colonies. So how could you measure that? It's like an encourage independent assay. When, so can, encourage independent assay is a hallmark of cancer cells and you could measure it through soft agar assay. So, so what it tells you? So whenever you knock down DDX5 using small interfering RNA, there is no DDX5 expression, you will have less number of cancer cells. That tells you that how much cancer cell is dependent upon this DDX5. This is, a, this is the in data that encouraged us to move forward with this research. We move forward, then we try to question why DDX5 is important for small cell lung cancer. Why small cell lung cancer needs, needed it? We did an RNA-seq with this differential gene expression, and we found out that interestingly, whenever you knock down DDX5, the mitochondrial function gets dysregulated in small cell lung cancer. So that tells you mitochondria gets somehow affected whenever you have a DDX5 knockout. 
we move forward and we found out that there is a down regulated oxidative phosphorylation whenever you have ddx5 knockdown so something to do with mitochondria so whenever you do not have ddx5 the cancer cells have a huge mitochondrial dysfunction so we move forward and try to find out that what is really happening inside the system inside the system of the small cell lung cancer so we measured it and we found out that there so there is a uh, technique called seahorse extracellular flux analyzer where they measure the basal and the maximum oxygen consumption rate so whenever there is ddx5 knockdown there is lesser oxygen consumption rate and as a result also there is a change in mitochondrial morphology as you could see there is mitochondrial cluster that actually reflects the reduction in inner membrane potential and also like a reduction in mitochondrial function so overall what you could say like this small cell lung cancer like whenever you have ddx5 knockdown there is a mitochondrial dysfunction that is happening inside the system another interesting data that pointed out is ddx5 protein is hugely overexpressed in small cell lung cancer compared to the normal one so there these are the two cell lines that we worked before and also working currently. One of them is A69, which is a chemo sensitive one. And one of them is A69AR, which is a chemo resistant one. So we are exploring the phenomena in both the cases, be it chemo sensitive cell line, be it chemo resistant cell line. And we just wanted to see why this DDX5 expression, because you could see no band here. No, in non-small cell lung cancer here, there is also no band. But in HBEC, you could hardly detect any band. But there is an overexpression of DDX5. So why this overexpression is our next question. So but before going on to that, I would like to give a brief overview of DDX5 mRNA. So as you as you are aware, like this, like the expert overexpression that I showed in my last slide is in the protein level. But what about the mRNA level? One straightforward approach is whenever you have a huge amount of mRNA overexpression, Automatically, you will have a huge amount of protein expression. So mRNA expression is directly proportional to protein expression. So we'd like to see that. So we did some data mining from the GPR data sets as well as from other data sets. So this is the normal uh, lung patient. And this is from the 19 uh, patients uh, we have from the various lung cancer patients. And interestingly, we found out in all those cases, DDX5, if mRNA is actually down-regulated compared to the normal individual who is not suffering from small cell lung cancer. Also, we explored the data sets from other cancers and we found out except for lymphoma, that is the red one, we did not find any DDX5 mRNA overexpression in most of the cancers. So in most of the cancer, DDX5 mRNA is actually down-regulated. So this is an interesting thing. mRNA level is down-regulated but the protein is up. So we would like to study it a bit elaborately. But before going on to that, our main question was, why DDX5 protein is overexpressed in A69 and A69 AR cell? So is it due to increased translation? Automatic. So the thing is, if you have a good translation, you, if you have a huge protein synthesis machinery, your cells, you will have a lot of protein. So automatically there will be a lot of protein in your cancer cells compared to the normal one. Another interesting thing is whether there is a change in stability. So the protein rate are same, but, your pro but the protein is much more stable in cancer lines and that makes it much more stable compared to the normal ones. Next thing is the RNA-seq is wrong. So the next thing is we have a data that prompted us to understand that DDX5 mRNA levels is actually down. But what if they are up? It could be like in our case, it is up. And, and the patient's data that we are seeing is not entirely true or else our data can be wrong maybe we got a very bad data somehow and it it is wrong so we we started exploring all the cases so we started our work with the rna part so what we use real time uh, quantitative rt pcr so to study the relative gene expression of ddx5 mrna in small cell lung cancer lines so hbec is the normal bronchial cell line and A69AR and A69 and DMS114 is another small cell lung cancer cell line. 
And interestingly, what we found out that it is actually corroborating the data that we got from the patient data sets as well. DDX5 mRNA is down. So it is actually saying that the RNA seq data was right. DDX5 mRNA levels is actually down and it has nothing to do with the overexpression of the protein. So we move forward. We move forward and try to see our second thing, where, whether our data is correct or not. So this time we use a different set of antibody. So the antibody that we used previously against DDX5 was a bit different, was a polyclonal in nature and directed towards a, a certain epitope. Now the antibody that we used is directed towards another epitope and we found out a similar result. Here also, compared to HBEC, a in A69 and A69AR, you have a huge protein overexpression of DDX5. And RFC1 here is the control. And you could see the internal control is almost, their levels are almost comparable. So I did a quantification and found out that, yes, the data that we published in our previous paper is actually right. DDX5 protein is actually overexpressed in the cancer cell lines compared to the normal one. So what our message is, RNA levels are actually down, so RNA has nothing to do with this. And also, the three, like the like the A69 and A69AR, you have a huge protein expression compared to HBEC. So we move forward with this data, and we uh, we showed that there is actually an inverse relationship between mRNA expression and protein expression. So mRNA is actually down in cancer cells compared to the normal uh, bronchial cell line, but the protein expression is huge. So inverse relation. So now we try to understand why this protein overexpression. So we wanted to, first we wanted to go ahead with the stability. And we found out that there is something to do with stability that I will show the results now. But how to measure stability? So there is an interesting assay called cyclohexamide chase assay. So what is this assay? So it's very easy. So you grow the cells, you add, at cyclohexamide in a certain concentration and you shut off the translation. So suppose you have 100 proteins left in HBEC, in H69 and H69AR, and you would like to see the half-life of these 100 proteins over a period of time. So you collect the cells at different time points and just measure their stability. So I did the Western blot study and I found out a very interesting data that I have mentioned. So in HBEC 3 kt you could see over a period of 36 hours, the protein is almost gone. So it's like it's not so stable in normal cell lines. But as you could see in A69AR and A69, the stability is huge. Even after 36 hours, it's huge. So it means like it has something to do with stability. So the protein is much more stable in cancer cell lines compared to HBEC. So this actually inspired me a lot so that so it has something to do with stability and stability is responsible for this over expression so this data is actually the turning point of our experiment and next we answered a very important question that the change in relative stability is due to the ddx of ddx5 is mainly responsible for this over expression in the cancer cells but why this uh stability so it has to be a something, a mechanism associated with it. So there are various reports that say like post-translational modification has a very important effect in stability. So be it sumoylation, be it phosphorylation, be it glycosylation, and be it any other post-translational modification, a protein half like protein stability gets increased and protein has there is also a change in the protein structure as well. So we move forward and wanted to study whether there is any post-translational modification happening in DDX5. So there are so from the literature, we found out that DDX5 phosphorylation is a very important event associated with the overexpression in many cancers as well as in various processes. So first we tried to find out that whether there is any phosphorylation happening in DDX5 and compared to uh, like uh, there is any change in phosphorylation status or there is any increased phosphorylation in DDX5 in cancer cells compared to the normal ones. That is responsible for their stability. So one of our former graduate student, Cindy, did a very interesting experiment. And she, she found out that, that in tyrosine 593, which is the widely reported uh, phosphorylation in DDX5, 
you, you could see in age 69, you will, you will have a lot of phosphorylation that is happening at this position. And in age 69 AR, there is something, but in age back, you could not see anything. Egg 293 is the positive control. So from this data, we found out that there is something phosphorylation happening. So I revalidate the data and I found out a similar type of a thing. So this is with the antibody directed against this uh, phosphorylated uh, uh, epitope. So, but we are thinking like not only this phosphorylation, there could be some additional phosphorylation events happening inside this uh, cancer cells that is also responsible for this uh, stability. So right now we are collaborating with Dr. Tao's lab and uh, in the department of biochemistry and we are doing a phosphoproteome analysis and i am not showing the data but we got some interesting data that pointed out that apart from this tyrosine 593 phosphorylation there is another phosphorylation that is also happening in ddx5 that is responsible for their uh, that is that may be responsible and i won't say responsible that may be responsible for the advancement of the small cell lung cancer and apart from that we also got various cell cycle uh, regulators that are also getting phosphorylated in cancer cell compared to the wild type. So right now we are working on this to find out what is really happening. So we got some data, we got some data for this DDX5 characterization, but how about treating them? Now the interesting thing is, as you are aware, there are less number of medications currently available for small cell lung cancer. So we need to develop new medications that could help us to treat small cell lung cancer. So the next important thing is how supinoxin works on small cell lung cancer. So supinoxin is an interesting drug that is very much effective on various types of cancer, be it triple negative breast cancer lines and any other cancer cells. We would like to, uh, like to see the effect of supinoxin on our small cell lung cancers as well. So supinoxin is a very important anti-cancer drug targeting the PDDX5 Y593. So initially supinoxin was studied on various types of cancers and it has we we got a like they, various groups got a very interesting data on supinoxin on triple negative breast cancer cell lines and it has reported that supinoxin can in inhibit triple negative breast cancer cell lines and reduces the tumor growth in patient derived xenograft tnbc mouse models as well and it passed the phase 1 clinical trials as well so with this we move forward and try to see the effect of supinoxin on our system as well. So why we chose supinoxin is interesting because we have some amount of phosphorylation happening in DDX5. We would like to see a similar type of event is also happening in our system as well, whether supinoxin is effective in our system as well. So let's see. So we got a very interesting data with supinoxin and found out that supinoxin is very much effective with cancer cells. So in age 69 AR cells, we did an assay and found out that supinoxin is very much important for the F on cancer cells and it inhibits the cancer cells and with a very low IC50 value. And also with the soft tagger assay, it tells you like whenever you have supinoxin at 70 nanomole concentration, you do not have any colonies left. So it is very much effective on small cell lung cancer. But what about in my studies? So we have a previous graduate student, Matt Russo, who along with our collaborator, Ben Elze, who was a PI in the Department of Pathobiology, we have found out that it can also reduce the cancer in in vivo model, mice model as well. So be it a 69 AR xenograft study. So, you in, so the main aim of this study is to induce tumor in mice and then add the drug in various concentration and see whether there is any reduction. So uh, we have seen that it has a tremendous uh, effect. The supinoxin has a tremendous effect of reducing the tumor growth in mice without any change in body weight, be it male, be it female mice. So supinoxin is equally effective in vitro as well as in in vivo model against small cell lung cancer. But what about the molecular model? So we have a model that states that how this supinoxin works. So it's very interesting. So what it states that like this proto-onco, like you have a DDX5 in red, and this proto-oncogene CABL actually phosphorylates DDX5. And as a result, it actually rescues beta-catenin from degradation. And as a result, you have beta-catenin that goes to the nucleus and you have wind responsive gene responsible for cancer. But whenever you have supinoxin, it binds to PDDX5 and it rescues this 
uh, CABL. And as a result, you do not have this uh, you do not have this beta uh, catenin now. And as a result, you do not have this win target genes. But we wanted to see whether this model is also acting in our system as well. So we have an idea that states that the supinoxin is definitely acting on the small cell lung cancer, but we do not know how it works. So we just wanted to see whether this model is also acting in our system as well. But interestingly, what we found out is like this model is like it is not corroborating. So the way it is acting on our system is not actually like visible in our, uh, the way it is acting in the triple negative breast cancer cell line, it is not acting in our model. And we see, be it in the presence and absence of supinoxin, you could see the levels of uh, the CMIC, cycline D1 and DDX5 mRNA levels remain similar. And also through Western blood data, we found out, be it in the presence and absence of supinoxin, their levels are almost comparable. They are almost similar. We also tried to uh, see what is happening in breast cancer cell line. And we found out that similar to age 69 AR, we have also found that the model is not fitting in breast cancer cell line also. And we found out, be it in the presence and absence of supinoxin, the levels is almost similar. And there is also another experiment that we did. We tried to measure the beta catenin localization. Remember, whenever you have supinoxin, you do, will not have beta catenin in the nucleus because it's almost degraded. And whenever you do, not have, so you do not have supinoxin, you have a nuclear accumulation. So there will be a change in nuclear to cytoplasmic accumulation whenever you have this. So interestingly, what we found out that be it in the presence and absence of supinoxin, be it A69AR and B8 breast cancer cell line, you do not see any change in the levels of beta catenin nuclear accumulation. So the first panel is the A69AR and the next panel is the MDMB231. So most probably it is not acting through that process. Also, we tried to see the localization of PDDX5 upon supinoxin treatment. There are no such reports of the localization of PDDX5 before. But we try to, we are we, we are very much interested to see the level of PDDX5. What is happening? Because there is a phosphorylation event happening. But interestingly, again, in various concentration of supinoxin and at various time points also, we didn't see any type of change in localization. So it is, it can be said that this model is not entirely correct. There should be some additional mechanisms happening. So with this, we move forward with our assay and we did a differential gene expression in the presence and absence of supinoxin in cancer cells. And we found out various interesting data. So there was, a, so this is Maria from our lab. So me and Maria did uh, RNA-seq analysis. And we found out that there is a lot of targets that is upregulated. And most of them has to do with replication machinery. So currently we are digging onto the data and try to find out what are the exact ways through which supinoxin works with small cell lung cancer and that could actually shed onto a therapeutic regime against small cell lung cancer. So supinoxin is most likely acting through alternative pathways and will soon try to find out how. So with this, I would like to end this talk with the conclusion that DDX5 mRNA levels does not, is matching with the RNA-seq data. It has nothing to do with the overexpression. It is the protein that is to do with overexpression and most probably protein stability has to do with this overexpression. And if you go back, post-translational modification, that is phosphorylation, has something to do with this uh, modification. And the current model of supinoxin is, like, is most likely not correct. There should be some alternative pathways through which supinoxin works on small cell lung cancer. But yes, supinoxin definitely works on small cell lung cancer. And we have a drug that is very much effective with the small cell lung cancer. And that is a good news. So future works is mainly on the other cell lines that we are working and wanted to taste that way the similar events is happening on those cell lines as well. Also wanted to explore the post-translational modification in a broader way and also exploring the mechanism of supinoxin. That will be very, very important for the society. So with this, I would like to end my talk with the acknowledgement. So this is my lab. This is from the picture from the last fall. So here it's like Yusuf who joined VAI, Van and Ladis. So this is Maria, this is uh, Matt who joined a uh, nearby lab, Sujit's lab, and this is Daniel, an undergrad who was, who was very much interested in medical school. We have collaborators for this uh, for this uh, uh, experiments like Ben Elze, who helped a lot with the, my studies, and Professor Andy Tao, who is helping us with the uh, uh, 
with the post translational modification, specifically student Kai. And other collaborators we have is Danzo Young, who, is DDX, who works on DDX5 and G4. So we have the fund from NIH and Purdue Cancer Research Center. And we are very much grateful to them for giving me for giving us the funding. And we have a quote that I wanted to say is this quote is, it's not all, it seems impossible until it's done. So when I first joined here, I had no expertise on mammalian cell lines, but slowly I started learning it. And now I have this full expertise and I can do it. So it was impossible for me for the beginning, how it works, whether I can do it or not, but now it's done and I can do it. So that gives me a confidence to work. So for the students that I wanted to say, like never like accept the challenges, accept the opportunities and work. So with this, I would like to encourage, like, like to uh, see like what I am doing in my postdoc journey. So I am a member of PPDA as well, Purdue Postdoctoral Association, where I was very much uh, involved, actively involved with other members for various events that you see where various events and also I'm giving many talks to various areas so that it can increase my skills and also I get good questions that I can use it my, for my research. Thank you. This is from Bowen County. I like West Lafayette a lot and I like this weather a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Subhadeep. Uh, awesome talk and a great, great journey and uh you know, maybe I'll ask you, I'll ask you uh, a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, what was the scariest part of your journey so far? What would you say was like, oh, my gosh, that was really difficult because I was so scared to take to go on it? Uh, yes, good question. The scariest, the scariest part was from the transition from India to USA. So you know, like it's a different, uh, like a different ambience altogether, different uh, places altogether. I have to make new friends, not only in research. So you have to understand you are when you are coming to a new place. Not only you have to do research, you have to understand the scenario around it. So I don't know, like I was uh, there in my house. I was never alone from my parents. So now it's like a two years. I am alone from my parents. I can work. So it's it makes me feel independent. And also my my mentor helped me a lot to make me more independent. She is a great mentor and yes. she helped me a lot to achieve my things. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Any anything in particular that uh that she's taught you that you think, oh, this is gonna stick around in my mind uh forever. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. Any yeah. less any particular lessons, anything you want to share with us? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. One lesson is like she always taught me to be independent about thinking. So it's like, like from the very uh, for at the very beginning, I always go to her and say, "Hey, uh, can you tell me what to do?" And she said, "No, you think. Thinking is very important. I will help you after this, but it's more about thinking. You have to think and give me an idea. I will support you, and I will tell you whether it's it can be implemented or not." I really, I really like this. She makes me independent. Now I'm very much confident with many things. So that she makes me a complete person. I really love it. Yeah. And it, it's one of the real advantages of, of having this type of time in your life to be able to sit down in a quiet place, turn off email, turn off the phone, turn everything off and just think about what it is that you're dealing with. It's so awesome. Yeah, Super deep Das, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Postdoctoral uh, research assistant in the Department of Biochemistry, working uh, with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Tran. And uh, thank you so much for telling us about your journey and uh, being our uh, lecture hall series lecturer today. It was a pleasure and uh, best wishes on your continued success. Thank you, Tommy. And you gave me this opportunity and it was really wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.